Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And welcome also to another episode in our series that looks at the members of William Shakespeare's Playing Company. I will be adding this video to the playlist and then also linking that playlist in the description box of this video. I continue to be interested in exploring my hypothesis that by exploring the biographies of the members of this company, we are able to gain further insight into Shakespeare's creative process and also his motivations. I believe that he created many of these roles with specific individuals in mind and that that arguably would have had an effect on how those characters and indeed the plot lines that they were part of would ultimately play out. Now it's time to take a look at the life and career of Robert Armin. The first video I produced for this series was on William or Will Kemp. He was the original performer who took on the clowning or fooling roles in the plays that were performed by this company. However, Kemp would leave the company at some point, probably in around 1599, for reasons that are still unclear. But what is clear is that he would be replaced by Robert Armin. It is suggested that Robert Armin was born in the 1560s. He was one of the children to be born to John Armin, who was a tailor of King's Lynn. John's profession almost certainly would have required him to have completed an apprenticeship in his youth, which in turn would have enabled him to join the Guild of Tailors and then have apprentices of his own. I do intend upon creating a video, or indeed videos, on the Guilds, the apprenticeship networks, and also the role of these institutions within civic life. It was often the case that the sons of guild members would be apprenticed to other guild members. Some boys would go to learn the trade that was also practiced by their fathers, while others would be sent to pursue a different trade and training. The age at which an individual would start an apprenticeship was not completely fixed, and nor was the length of the apprenticeship they might be signed up for. An average age of 14 or 15, with an indenture lasting seven years, may well be common, but it was by no means universal. In October 1581, an indenture document was created to bind the teenage, probably early teens, Robert Armin as an apprentice for 11 years to the goldsmith John Lonison. The extended length of this apprenticeship being 11 years rather than the more average seven perhaps points to the fact that Robert Armin was younger than the average age of a person normally taking up an apprenticeship. And there is provision for this because the contract can simply be extended. He needs to be in an apprenticeship for 11 years because he simply won't be old enough to strike out on his own once seven years might be up. The 11 years allow him to be cared for and also educated until he reaches the appropriate age, as it would have been deemed. Robert Armin's apprenticeship was certainly a prestigious placement. Not only was the profession of goldsmith a well-respected one, but also Robert's new master occupied a plum role as master worker of the Queen's Mint at the Tower of London. After Lonison's death in 1582, Robert's apprenticeship transferred to another goldsmith, John Kettlewood. Robert's indenture then came to a close in 1592. Twelve years later, in 1604, Robert was still sufficiently connected and apparently respected amongst his fellow goldsmiths for him to be able to claim the freedom of the goldsmith's company. And then in 1608, Robert would take on his own apprentice goldsmith, James Jones. However, it is almost certain that Robert and his apprentice were only goldsmiths in the most nominal sense. Certainly, it seems that even before his own apprenticeship was finished, Robert Armin was already following other creative pursuits, namely as a writer and performer. And then if we take James Jones for an example, Robert's apprentice, it certainly seems that he was trained by Robert, but for the theatre rather than for any goldsmith's workshop. 
because James Jones would go on to perform with the Lady Elizabeth's men. It's also likely that another goldsmith, one Robert Treat, who was apprenticed at the same time as Robert Armin and who actually continued in the profession of goldsmithing, took on his own apprentice to be trained for the stage. As Treat did not tread the boards himself, so to speak, it is thought that he may actually have taken on this apprentice with the intention of Armin being the one to train him up in his profession rather than in the trade of goldsmithing. Early in his apprenticeship, Robert Armin came to the attention of Elizabeth I's favourite clown and member of the Queen's men, Richard Tolton. Martin Butler states that Tolton, quote, adopted him, that's Robert Armin, as his son, prophesying he would enjoy my clown suit after me. So it sounds to me that another kind of apprenticeship was thus running alongside, or perhaps even instead of, whatever the goldsmiths were supposed to be teaching Robert to do. It's my claim that his clowning practice must have begun fairly early in his apprenticeship, and that's due to the fact that Richard Tolton would die in 1588. And let's just remember that Robert's apprenticeship begins in 1581, so just seven years before Richard Tolton dies. If we consider the weight that is attached to Tolton's influence on Robert's life, I would argue that it's fairly safe to assume that their connection must have begun a fair few years before 1588. In the early 1590s, as his apprenticeship was coming to an end, Robert was being presented and named as an author of ballads in the writings of both Thomas Nash and Gabriel Harvey. And this is perhaps only to be expected, as Robert's mentor, Tolton, was also known to be a skilled musician and constructor of witty verses of his own. Robert then would come to be famed as an actor, musician and writer of pamphlets and of plays. By the middle of the 1590s, Robert was touring as part of the Lord Shandoss's men, and this may well have been interspersed with some time spent both touring and performing on his own as well. At the end of the decade, by 1599, he would replace, or possibly push out, Will Kemp, when he joined the Lord Chamberlain's men and became a sharer in that company's profits, as Kemp had been before him. In many ways, I would argue that this change in personnel and then the shift in the characters created in its aftermath is some of the clearest evidence to say that this particular playwright's creative output was certainly shaped by the people in his company. He alters his writing based upon their physicality, their particular skills, and occasionally their biographies. I think we can see real evidence to support this if we look at what is likely to have been Robert Armin's first role with the Lord Chamberlain's men, namely the role of Touchstone in As You Like It. It is believed that this play was first staged in 1599 and that it was potentially the play that opened the company's new theatre, The Globe. Let's take a look at the character's name, because arguably that's where the connection begins. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a touchstone is, quote, fine-grained black stone, upon which objects made of gold or silver can be rubbed to determine their purity. For a character that was to be played by an individual who had himself in real life obtained the freedom of the company of goldsmiths, to then be named after a goldsmith's tool feels like more than a mere coincidence to me. I mean, after all, it would certainly have been in the interests of the Lord Chamberlain's men to announce as widely as possible that they could count among their number an individual who belonged to such a respected profession and guild. Touchstone is a court fool or a jester, meaning that his life would have been spent at the Ducal Palace, entertaining the Duke, his family and presumably noble guests. In Act 1, Scene 2, Touchstone is referred to as a natural a natural fool or innocent would, it is thought, have been differentiated from a motley fool, which is how Jaquees describes Touchstone in Act 2, Scene 7. At the time, natural fools or innocents who lived and entertained in noble or royal households almost certainly would have been people with developmental delays, 
and or potentially physical differences as well, perhaps instead of. We can arguably find a real world example of this if we look at the painting of the family of Henry VIII. Here we see Jane the Fool in the left hand doorway. It has been suggested that Jane would have been known as a natural fool or innocent because according to the documentary evidence that we have access to, it does seem likely that Jane had a companion, also known as a keeper. This keeper came in the form of the trained entertainer, Lucretia the Tumbler. So it's thought likely that Jane presumably required some level of support in her day-to-day life. Naturals or innocents were, it seems, welcome at court. Indeed, it was deemed virtuous to ensure that they were well-fed, dressed in fine clothes and cared for. It was thought that their perceived innocence may give them a special access to the truth, perhaps even to the divine, and thus their words were frequently searched and analysed for near prophetic meaning. Nevertheless, and despite all of this, this practice was still clearly massively exploitative. Naturals, as they were known, would not, for example, be free to leave a court at their will. They may instead be passed from master to master as a gift with no say in the matter. There would be no real recourse for them to complain of ill treatment or even abuse they may suffer. And they may spend much of their lives being treated as little more than a curiosity. If those at court found humour in their words or actions it must unfortunately be queried as to whether they were laughing with them or at them. However, in the case of Touchstone, as I mentioned a moment ago, Jaquees identifies him as a motley fool, which instead points to him being the sort of performer that might usually be found in the uniform of a professional trained court fool or jester. So if the real Jane was in fact a natural fool, then Touchstone should perhaps more properly be referred to as an artificial fool, someone who plays with folly for profit, and who usually would mock the behaviours and indeed the pretensions of the elite individuals he entertained to do so. Next up, we have Twelfth Night, which is dated to the following year, 1600. In this play, Robert plays Feste, the fool who is employed by Olivia, And here we have another character that we might expect to see costumed in Motley. His comedic and incisive commentary on his fellow characters puts him almost in parallel with the audience. We watch alongside him and follow his commentary, but we also watch him watching and enjoy his performance. Nevertheless, Feste is clearly not a wholly benign character, because he does take an active and for some people I would say uncomfortable role in terrorising the priggish and puritanical Malvolio. Malvolio has already been humiliated and locked away in a darkened room and now he is being told that he is believed to be a quote poor mad prisoner. There is a cruelty in this act despite how unlikable Shakespeare has made Malvolio and this cruelty I think somewhat undercuts the comedy that's presented by Feste. Here, he is shown to be cruel. For Robert, this role would require him to don disguises, put on voices, sing and dance. Robert will take on another courtly fool in around 1605 in the play King Lear. Like Touchstone as you like it, Lear's fool has loyally followed his master into exile also like him, there may be some confusion regarding this fool's capacity and control over his words and actions. Is he a natural or an artificial fool? Modern directors, and indeed audiences, often come down on the side of Lear's fool being an artificial, that his madness or foolishness is feigned, a tool that he uses so that he may hold up a mirror to his king. However, that perhaps should be questioned, as too should our perceptions of developmental delay and neurodiversity and especially how that was seen in the early modern period, because it may well be that Shakespeare was writing a natural fool. 
someone who he viewed as being certainly capable of being witty, incisive and sarcastic, irrespective of any other challenges that that individual may have faced. Like Feste, Lear's Fool is, for the audience, both a commentator and a character. Also, like Feste, there has been a question over how benign his humour is. Some critics have posited that because of his near constant criticism, the fool may need to take some responsibility for Lear's worsening mental health. The fool's disappearance has also generated commentary. Now, he may simply not reappear because he has done his job and brought Lear back to his senses. Alternatively, he may be removed from the later scenes due to their tragic nature and how therefore unfitting it may have been to have a comedic character present. Yet, some have suggested that what is actually happening is that the fool is just absent from the scenes that have Cordelia in them. And that this is happening because both of these parts would be played by the same person. Now, Martin Butler states that Robert Armin was, quote, physically slight, possibly even stunted. Could it be that his small stature may have given him a similar physicality to the boy players who would normally take on women's parts? Parts like Cordelia. Butler also explains that while Robert, quote, was less athletic than Kemp, he was more sharp-witted, ruminative and self-conscious about his artifice. Butler goes further, saying that, quote, Following Armin's arrival in The Chamberlain's Men, Shakespeare capitalised on his talents by creating a series of roles for a new kind of comedian. The old-style Elizabethan clown metamorphosed into a more psychologically layered, self-aware and wittily ingenious figure, giving full rein to his mimicry and his much more intellectual approach to his art. Indeed, a number of other roles can logically be connected to Robert Armin, including, but not limited to, the Porter in Macbeth of 1606 and Autolycus in The Winter's Tale of 1610. The Porter appears in Act 2, Scene 3, which is right after the murder of Duncan. On the one hand, he is a total shift in energy and thus might be read as simply comic relief. On the other hand, that shift is, I think, somewhat jarring. Rather than being easy comedy, this character's seemingly jovial references to Hellgate, the judgment of God, the everlasting bonfire, all come hot on the heels of a regicide that the porter apparently doesn't know anything about. And so I wonder if this scene may have been more anxiously than humorously received. Certainly, I do wonder how the very first audiences of this play would have experienced the Porter's smutty exchange with Macduff about lechery, in particular his euphemistic references to standing to, especially as they have just seen a pair of blood-soaked Macbeths in the previous scene. The singing peddler Autolycus is also, I think, a character whose place as a figure of fun is somewhat undercut by a sense of menace or complexity. The audience is presented with a figure who deceives and robs his fellow characters. We see him lie for his own ends. Surely then, any audience member must also question everything he tells us too. And yet, he is so likeable. He sings and he jokes and he gets us on his side. Additionally, Autolycus' schemes ultimately assist, albeit unintentionally on Autolycus's part, the thwarted lovers Florizel and Perdita. So, do these characters tell us what kind of performer Robert Armin was? How might his arrival in Shakespeare's orbit have altered that playwright's creative process? Perhaps understandably, assessments of Robert Armin often include a comparison with his forerunner in the company, Will Kemp. This is certainly the case if we take a look at Joan Tucker's doctoral thesis from 2002, which looks at Will Kemp and Robert Armin as Shakespeare's fools. She writes, quote, Kemp was often cast as the bumbling fool, the country rustic who would confuse and mispronounce words and who communicated with the audience 
with earthy language and physical gestures. Kemp had the habit of extending his time on stage. Shakespeare may have included substantial clown parts in order to satisfy the clown's hunger for centre stage and the audience's love of foolery. I believe then the difference is quite clear to us because we have seen that the characters that were played by Robert Armin were creatures of the court rather than of the country. They were frequently masters of wordplay and even innuendo rather than being bumbling malaprops. Returning once again to Martin Butler, quote, Kemp's speciality had been robust physical comedy and crowd-pleasing improvisation. He typically played men of limited intelligence but shrewd common sense and was admired for his jigs. Athletic and somewhat risque song and dance routines, Armin's line was quite different. Catherine A. Henzi is in agreement, stating, quote, When he, meaning Armin, joined the Lord Chamberlain's men, the leading comic role shifted from rustic buffoonish clown to witty wise fool. In addition to his sophisticated wit, Armin was known for his musicality. With his arrival, there was a marked increase in singing in Shakespeare's plays. Some scholars have asserted that Kemp's antics became tiresome for the playwright and his company, that they ultimately caused a falling out, which in turn led to Kemp breaking with them. Some say that Kemp and Armin overlapped in the company and that Armin was in fact brought in to essentially bring Kemp down a peg or two or even better to force him out. However, any evidence to support either of these stories or indeed any of the others that have been proposed is lacking. Because although Kemp's decision to walk away from the Lord Chamberlain's men and from his coveted place as a sharer in the long-term profits of that company, may certainly feel abrupt and somewhat poorly timed in relation to Kemp's financial future, none of this necessitates there having been a falling out. Equally, just because, as we have seen here, Robert Armin, who replaces Kemp, plays different types of comedic characters, it doesn't necessarily follow that Kemp was thus screamingly unpopular with his colleagues and simply had to be gotten rid of. Equally, of course, it may well indicate that that is exactly what was happening. By being connected to roles like the Porter and Autolycus, we do see that Robert Armin remains with Shakespeare's company as they go from being the Lord Chamberlain's men to being the King's men. In 1610, Ben Johnson, who was another playwright working for the company, produces his play The Alchemist, in which Robert Armin would take on the role of the greedy but gullible character of Drugger. We then lose track of Robert for around five years. He next appears in the historical record at the time of his burial, which took place at St Botolph's Allgate on November 30th, 1615. Robert left behind a will, dated to the 5th of December 1614, in which he states, among other things, because it is very wordy, quote, All the rest of my said worldly substance, whatsoever it be, my debts being paid and funeral discharged, I fully and wholly give and bequeath unto my said loving wife, Alice Armin, whom I do make and ordain, my full and sole executrix of this, my last will and testament. But what do you think of the life and legacy of Robert Armin? Do you think that Robert is the one who pushed Will Kemp out? What do you make of the apparent shift in the comedic characters that were being written by Shakespeare when Robert, seemingly, took over from Will? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. Or you can come and find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please consider following me over on some or indeed all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not consider sharing it with your friends? please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, maybe have a little check now.
make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. While you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not also hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that's going to appear so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. And just in case, I might add that barring some catastrophe, accident or other unforeseen circumstance, I do upload every Friday at 4pm GMT. That's when my videos go live. So if all else fails, maybe set a calendar reminder, please. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I do look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.